It is a rare and unusual opportunity that I, a PhD student in the Department of English, would have the opportunity to come to such a wonderful thing called the Medical Grand Rounds. <laughs> the title, Grand Rounds, very um, The spirit and idea of Grand Rounds, or namely gathering together staff, students, residents, physicians, faculty, and some other foreign humanities bodies that we disperse through the crowd today, to discuss the care of patients and public health. This spirit and this idea was the quilting point for a new partnership that brought the public humanities at Western into contact with the Narrative Medicine Initiative, and led by Dr. Shannon Arnfeld. Rather than keeping in our discrete ecosystems like two Darwinian species offering confused looks at one another across our disciplinary habitats, <laughs> both groups came together to explore two common experiences that affect everyone in this room, whatever discipline you're from storytelling, and illness. Undaunted by C.P. Snow's classic and contested thesis of the divided two cultures, the arts and sciences, we began the construction on a new project, Stories of Illness and Health, which is taking place on Sunday as part of the Words Literary Festival that is downtown at uh, Museum London and the London, Health si or, sorry, the, uh, London Public Library. And we invite everybody to come down and see that. There's posters all over. This project is a hybrid public engagement program that combines the art of storytelling with the power of first-person experiential narratives of patient care in a public form with the ultimate aspiration of placing emphasis on a human-centered form of care, tarrying with the thick description of what it's like to navigate the life-altering experience of illness, both physical and psychological. No interdisciplinary, interinstitutional collaboration is without its challenges. And one of our biggest obstacles was forging the project with a critical vocabulary to make passageways between medicine and the arts, the university and the hospital, <coughs> literature and science, fiction and nonfiction. We are very lucky today, today to have one of Canada's brightest lights in medicine and literature, Dr. Vincent Lamb, whose literary and nonfiction works dexterously move across boundaries and challenge existing systems, literary and medical, blazing a trail for literary scholars, writers, doctors, and readers to follow in attending to the human, the all too human stories and experiences of illness. Dr. Vincent Lamb, born here in London, Ontario, you knew I was going to mention that part, uh, did his medical training in Toronto and was an emergency physician in Toronto for 13 years before moving to addictions medicine. That was, I understand, from this morning's conversation a few months ago. He is a lecturer at the University of Toronto and has also worked in international air evacuation and expedition medicine in the Arctic and Antarctic ships. Dr. Lamb's first book, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, hit the Canadian literary scene like a meteor newly entering the atmosphere, winning the 2006 Scotiabank Giller Prize before making its way to the screen as an HBO Canada television series. He followed up his debut book with a non-fiction work, The Flu Pandemic and You, a co-authored book, a guide to influ influenza pandemics, and a biography of Tommy Douglas. Dr. Lamb's first novel, The Headmaster's Wager, is about a high-stakes Chinese gambler and headmaster of an English school in Saigon around the Vietnam War. So mid to mid-60s to mid-70s, and is a novel that tackles questions of addiction, war, and desire. It's interesting to note that Vincent began this work inspired by his, in part by his grandfather, before writing Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures but set it aside to return to it later when he felt prepared to tackle the emotional depths of this story. It was a finalist for the 2012 Governor General's Award, long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, long listed for the Impact Dublin Literary Prize, these are heavy duty awards, and short listed for the Commonwealth Book Prize. It's a formidable list of achievements. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vincent. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, and thank you to the Schulich School of Medicine, and particularly to Faisal, Shannon, 
Josh and Phil and all others who had a hand in organizing this great event. Thank you to yourselves for being here. It's a beautiful day outside. So, you know, when, uh, when the weather is beautiful outside, I always feel particularly obliged to make it grand, <laughs> as, the, uh, as the name implies. So, um, I'm going to talk about medicine. I'm going to talk about stories. And particularly, I'm going to talk about why I think that stories are of absolutely crucial importance to medicine in an age which is dominated by evidence. Now, I am a writer, and so I'm going to begin by telling you a story. And you don't have to stare at, uh, this is, I think, just to prove that I'm actually a writer, just to say, you know, I actually have a book, <laughs> right? Some people say they're writers, and you know, it's really just uh, something they're thinking about doing in the future or whatever. No, I've actually published a book, and this is the most recent. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a story which is unrelated to this book. You can close your eyes if you wish, or not. Some people feel weird about that. Imagine that you lived 4,000 years ago. And one day, the place where you live will be called London, Ontario. But this means nothing to you. There is a great body of water where you fish and over which you can travel. Your people travel from season to season, from one place to another, to gather plants, to track and hunt game. One evening, you are rushing through the dusk to reach the safety of your camp and its fire. You stumble over a tree root and fall. When you rise, your leg is wet with blood. Three days later, you are overcome with heat. The leg is swollen and burning. You cannot walk. The village shaman is summoned. And you barely recognize him, for you have become confused. For days, the shaman visits frequently. He sings and chants. He feeds you strange extracts, tells you the healing stories. He applies a mixture of mud and plants to your wound. Your family feeds you special herbs that are known to give strength. And gradually, your fever subsides. The swelling in your leg retreats. You recover. You may open your eyes if you wish. So I've told you a story. And you may be thinking a few things about that story. Our biomedical minds immediately think, OK, well, this is someone who fell, had an injury, maybe became septic was given some sort of pharmacological substances, which may or may not have had antibiotic properties, and got better, whether through their powers or by chance. Now, of course, the academics and administrators amongst us will say, this is egregious. The shamanic practitioner was clearly not accredited by the college. <laughs> there was no evidence base for this treatment. Undoubtedly, there were, there were no trials, certainly not double-blind RCTs. <laughs> Assuredly, the mud applied to the wound was not sterile. <laughs> and it was also not documented properly in the hospital's new digital <laughs> mod. And almost certainly, you're wondering, why did I tell you that story? What's that about? Well, as I said, I'm a doctor, I'm a writer, so I work with medicine, and I work with stories. And I've given you this albeit fictional, ancient narrative of illness and healing, just for you to mull upon, tuck it away in the back of your mind, and I'll come back to it. It's part of what I'm trying to do, which is to shift your perspective slightly on what it is that we are doing in medicine and what we are doing with stories. Now, I'm going to make the case that what we do as doctors and as nurses and as healthcare providers is fundamentally about narrative and story. And certainly, I think we should always ask ourselves the question, why is it that we do what we do? When we are teaching our medical students and residents, we should ask ourselves, what exactly is the purpose of this profession? I hope this is not it. <laughs> it's just a simple operation, routine, boring, only doing it for the money. I really hope that's not it. Now, certainly, I think that we all sometimes crave for things which are simple. We would like things to be linear sometimes. You know, problem A leads to solution B. 
which inevitably leads to a favorable outcome C. But some of medicine is like that, and lots of medicine is not like that. This is how I felt when I was accepted into medical school. Ta-da! The dream. Some of you have had that experience. You know, butterflies will fly into the sunset. It'll be amazing. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I will enter a world of the clear diagnosis, the omniscient doctor, perfect treatments for every condition. Eh. <laughs> not so much. The reality is that sometimes diagnoses are unclear. We are certainly not omniscient. And the reason that we have the concept of the NNT, or the number needed to treat, is that sometimes you have to treat a few people in order for someone to get a benefit. Now, certainly, we do live in an age in which we can understand these concepts to some degree, because we live in an age of evidence. We live in an age of information. Information is what we trade on and what we use. It also exists hand in hand with our digital age, in which information comes to us in many forms. And I think we can all attest that while the digital age brings information <laughs> and evidence to our fingertips, it can be distracting. And uh, you know, we've all heard of surgical checklists. It might be that one of the checklist items should be to turn off all your pagers and cell phones during procedures. Because sometimes we're very, very busy. Sometimes there's a lot going on with all this information and the digital world constantly assailing us. And this is part of why I think that we need stories in this age of evidence to help make sense of what's going on, to remember what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. So I'm going to try to convince you that in teaching medicine and in practicing medicine, we are teaching a story and practicing a story. I am going to make the case that the modern medical narrative, which we know quite well, is powerful. And also, that to be a really great doctor, doctors must work with human stories in addition to evidence. There's no disrespect intended towards evidence. So in teaching medicine, we, tell, we teach a story. I guess these look like the storybooks, right? I think a lot of people in this room have a bookshelf that looks something like this. Where did these books come from? Ultimately, the lineage of these works is from the great medical educators who came before us. The great educators who wrote these books gave us our great books, our Bibles, if you will, and we are part of that heritage. Now, I'm going to give you a complete history of medicine in the next five minutes. Actually, that's not true. I'm going to give you a totally selective and biased <laughs> and arbitrary, random smattering uh, overview of medicine. That's actually what I'm going to do. So that said, Hippocrates, 460 BC to 370 BC. Uh, and he's often thought of as the father of modern Western medicine. I think this is because he was one of the first to believe that diseases were caused naturally and were not attributable to superstitions, gods, moral debts. He had lots of anatomical and physiological beliefs which turned out to be untrue, such as the bodily humorous theory. He felt that physicians should be well-kept, honest, calm, understanding, and serious. Which always makes me worry, because it seems to imply that prior to Hippocrates, doctors were messy, dishonest, anxious, judgmental, <laughs> and frivolous. But in any case, you know, he was a professional trendsetter. Let's just say that. Here is Hippocrates refusing a gift from Alexander the Great, apparently, because at that time, the drug rep had not yet been invented. <laughs> so this was, you know, the stand-in. Galen, AD 129 to 200, remembered as an anatomist. One of his major contributions to medicine was his work on the circulatory system. He recognized there was a difference between arterial and venous blood, which is something that we now take for granted as one of our pieces of medical understanding. He did have a number of beliefs which we no longer hold, such as the, uh, the concept of humors and the concept that you could suck out congested blood. Uh, Here lieth the malady, I sucketh it with cup. So he was doing a few things that are not part of our, our modern medical armamentarium. Although I was speaking to someone briefly about hemochromatosis, um, for which you know, bloodletting is performed. So some things endure uh, in some corners of medicine. Vesalius, 1514 to 1564. Uh, he was a man of the Renaissance. He was immensely influential. 
And he is often called the founder of modern anatomy because he was one of the first people to actually systematically dissect humans. The Galenic anatomy was really based on animal dissections, um, some observations of, uh, uh, of eviscerated gladiators, um, and, uh, and it wasn't until Vesalius that people really began to look at the human body in a systematic and critical way. And so, you know, he comes to us as someone who gave us a critical evaluation of previous beliefs. Nonetheless, when I look at some of his illustrations, I sort of think that either people had many more small bowel loops <laughs> at that time, or there was still some interpretation. I mean, you just see there must be like 40 feet of bowel in that picture. And so this sort of you know, gives us an entree to the modern era where we have concepts of anatomy, concepts of critical evaluation of previous beliefs. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in time and tell you that this modern medical narrative, the era in which we now find ourselves, is in fact very powerful. And I'm going to tell you a little story. You may not recognize uh, this excellent doctor. Um, this is Ignaz Semmelweis, who lived from 1818 to 1865. I know that there's at least one obstetrician in the crowd, so you'll uh, appreciate and I think sympathize and empathize with his story. And so Semmelweis made the very important observation that if medical students washed their hands following dissection of cadavers, but before going to the labor and delivery floor to deliver the babies of pregnant women, that the incidence of puerperal fever, which at the time was a very, very common cause of maternal mortality, plummeted dramatically, right? So this seems like a very, very useful finding. Uh, for this, you know, he's now recognized in some circles as an early pioneer of antiseptic procedures. Now, interestingly, Ignaz Semmelweis was known to be a temperamental person, a person who didn't really get along with his colleagues. He didn't really have an explanation for this observation. This was before germ theory. This was before Louis Pasteur, Joseph Lister. No one really knew why this was taking place. And as we know is sometimes the case, even in modern times, people didn't like to be told to wash their hands. <laughs> so, uh, so Semmelweis tried to push this through uh, his department. Uh, people uh, were upset with him. He was consigned, unfortunately, to an insane asylum where he died at the age of 47 after being beaten by the guards shortly after his admission. So this is sort of a sad story. Um, I tell you this for a few reasons. First of all, you know, if you feel that you are having difficulty pushing through some sort of quality improvement initiative <laughs> in your department, you know, or some sort of practice change or a guideline, you know, you're coming up against roadblocks. It's very, very frustrating. I know, it's terrible. I feel badly for you. Think of Semmelweis. <laughs> Think of Semmelweis. You know, you will feel much better about yourself. And you'll say, you know, it's okay. This too shall pass. We'll get through it. We'll implement the change. I won't be thrown into an asylum and beaten to death by the gods. So, so that's very good. So the modern age of medicine is better. Right? <laughs> It truly is better in many, many ways. And then the other reason I bring up Semmelweis is that although his story is sad, it's very interesting that his insight prevailed. Sometime after that, people did begin to understand the concept of microbial infection. People did begin to understand that hands should be washed following the dissection of cadavers and before the uh, conduct of surgical procedures, and in fact, that hands should be washed quite frequently in general. And so, you know, it's interesting to me because this is an example of story change. There was an existing story. There was a Hungarian medical establishment which was powerful enough to reject this new story which was not well understood, but ultimately, the more powerful and more true story won out. And in a very direct way, this is the ethos of our modern understanding of medical evidence, that our story is one of constantly replaceable stories, that we learn new things and we change what was there before. So, this is poor Semmelweis 
telling people wash their hands. You know, this could be sort of the uh, in, in in the hospital in which I worked until recently. You know, we had hand washing secret police, right? <laughs> people who would sort of lurk, right? Um, all because of Semmelweis. Enough said. So the, the past century has really been a great success story in many ways for our practice of medicine. Uh, this is Banting and um, his collaborator Best. Banting lived from 1891 to 1941, discovered insulin for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1923. Um, and really the 20th century has been a century of great success for hygiene and sanitation, for immunization, and for effective pharmacology. You know, we've done all kinds of amazing things which we could not do 100 years ago. It's hard for us to remember sometimes that 100 years ago, there was no effective treatment for diabetes. Diabetes was effectively a death sentence. It's hard for us to remember that until around the Second World War, there were no effective antibiotics. And the mortality rate from pneumonia is quoted as being at approximately 25% up until that time. And what does the future hold for us? We don't know, but it probably involves new therapies, novel therapies, possibly involving genetics. This is James Watson and Francis Crick, who won the Nobel in 1962 for their elucidation of the double helix. So our modern medical narrative is that we have science, we have evidence, the new supplants the old. And so our story has become one of the changing story. The pinnacle of all of that is evidence. And at the very top, we have meta-analysis, which we hope would rest firmly upon RCTs, which are performed in a double-blind manner. So we could say, that's great, right? We have evidence. We have the magic solution. That's what it is. What's that story stuff that guy was talking about? Where was he going with that? Why exactly do we need stories? You know, we can just get the numbers, right? Well, maybe. First of all, it's a lot to carry around. You know, that big pyramid full of studies and data and all that stuff. You know, it's, it's very, very heavy stuff. Um, so. Thank God we have uh, smartphones and iPads and tablets so we can carry all the stuff around so we don't get sore backs. We can all have digital textbooks. You know, when I was a medical student, I used to distribute the books evenly between my right and my left pocket, you know, so that my lab coat wouldn't go askew as I was wandering around the hospital. And now it's just all in your smartphone, right? It's all there. So we have evidence. That should be enough, right? Home free. Well, maybe, maybe not. So I look at emergency medicine. And interestingly, in 1999, someone did a, a systematic review of the proportion of treatments in an emergency department in Sheffield, England, which were actually evidence-based. Interestingly, they found that you know, about 18% of the things that emergency docs in Sheffield were doing were actually evidence-based. You know, 32% were sort of self-evidently useful. I think that falls into the category of things like reducing shoulders that are dislocated, for example, self-evidently useful. You're not going to do a trial to, to figure out whether that's good or not. 28%, um, no evidence. 22% of the stuff that they were doing, I mean, not in my department, of course. <laughs> but apparently in this department, you know, 22% of the stuff, there was evidence they really shouldn't be doing it, but they were doing it anyways. So you could say, oh, these are terrible. These are emerge docs. What do they know? You know, a bunch of ignoramuses. You know, never mind them. The rest of medicine is evidence-based, and it's great, right? Hmm, maybe. In 07, a systematic review of over 1,000 Cochrane reviews found that, well, you know, 44% of the Cochrane reviews, which you're familiar with, interventions were thought to be likely beneficial. 49% of reviews found that, well, the evidence, you know, was kind of neither here nor there. In 96% of reviews, there was a recommendation for further research. We're not quite as smart as we think we are. And certainly, if we want to stand solely on evidence, we're not quite there yet. So you might say, well, 
Well, that's fine. But as an intellectual construct, all we need is more studies, more evidence, right? Maybe. Now, this is you know, the one slide where um, if you like numbers and that kind of thing, you can sort of perk up for a minute and then go to sleep again, <laughs> right? I'm sure that, that all of us learn these concepts at some point in medical school or at some point in our education, but I'm just going to review. So we look at studies and we think about studies in a few different ways and we think about the types of errors that are possible in studies. And when we talk about a type one error in a study, we say, well, you know, this is the possibility that the study shows a false positive. And we judge a study to be acceptable if there's you know, less than a 5% chance, based on the stats, that those results could have, been proved, could have been a result of chance alone. A type 2 error, you know, again, I'm sure many are familiar with this, is a false negative. And so this concept refers to power. And power, which is commonly referred to, you know, a study is powered to show something, is the ability of a study to avoid false negatives. So if, if a study claims to have a power of 0.8, what they're saying is that only two true hypotheses are going to be missed. Okay, so that's fine. You know, these are commonly accepted parameters for the acceptance of a paper for publication. So you would say, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, I'm willing to accept that as a clinician, as someone who wants to base my practice solely on evidence. All right. This is uh, an interesting paper by John Ioannidis with the uh, somewhat inflammatory title, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Mm, kind of discouraging. And so it's really just sort of a brief paper. It says, look, imagine a thousand hypotheses. Imagine a hundred of them are true. And you're trying to figure out which of the hundred are true. Well, if you accept these commonly accepted parameters in terms of the adequacy of studies, you'll accept a type 1 error rate of 5% which means that you know, 45 of the studies look positive when in fact they are part of the 900 true negatives. If you're going to accept a power of 0.8 for a study being publishable, then you're going to say, well, you know, it's okay if we miss 20 true positives and find 80 of them. When you look at the results of these 1,000 studies, you're going to end up with 45 false positives and 80 true positives, which is not nearly as good as we would like. It means about one third of them. Based on the parameters, simple mathematics that we accept for publication of studies, about one third are going to be mm, on a little bit of a shaky ground. Ioannidis also points out, and I think this is a fair thing to say, that these are generous assumptions. That when we look at things which are published, they don't always have a power of 0.8 or accept a false positive rate of 5%. If you reduce the power to 0.4, you end up with 45 false positives, 40 true positives. Hmm, the ground is a little bit shaky. Now again, I'm not slagging evidence. What I'm saying is that if we are going to be any better than the generations which told stories before us, we need to understand that our story is faulted because I think in every generation, it has been very, very difficult to accept that there are weaknesses in the story in which we're telling. I think that sort of put a damper on the room. So you think your job was tough? <laughs> you know, think of that poor shaman, the guy whom I told you a story about. You know, his tribe was decimated because he was a quack. All right, that's a bit of a cheesy one. But, the point I'm making is that what we're doing is not so different than what that shaman was doing once upon a time. Mircea Eliade, in his seminal text, Shamanism, would tell us the shaman is also a magician and medicine man. He is believed to cure, like all doctors, and to perform miracles. But beyond that, he may also be priest, mystic, poet, guardian of traditions. And in many ways, I think we are the guardians of a modern tradition. The modern tradition simply happens to be, at this point in history, a tradition of empiricism, numbers, facts. And yet, I think it's very important to always remember that great doctors must work with human stories. 
So, these are fantastic patients. You know, Mr. Owl has showed up with the eye problem, Mr. Rabbit with the ear problem, Mr. Elephant with the nose problem, and so on. I think we all know that patients don't necessarily come in such a neatly labeled fashion. In fact, if I think of my typical emergency medicine patient from my years of practicing emergency medicine, which I sadly left a few months ago, my typical patient would present with a pain in the right foot radiating to the left shoulder, <laughs> along with seeing stars in conjunction with a rash. <laughs> right? That would be my typical emergency medicine patient. I think anyone in primary care or emergency medicine would say, yeah, that's the way it goes. And I think most people in any discipline of medicine would say, yeah, you know what? People actually don't come all that neatly labeled. They have complicated, ambiguous presentations. And our job is to sort them out. Our job is to assemble a narrative and in many ways to give that narrative meaning. I think about many of the conditions in which my treatment as an emergency doctor would simply be to tell a story. I think of people with febrile seizures. I think of people with first trimester pregnancy loss, with a low risk head injury, people with pain management issues. All of these presentations to a primary care doctor or to an emergency doctor would be treated with an explanation of what is going on, an explanation of what to watch for, an explanation of what is about to happen and what should prompt further concern, i.e. the treatment would be a story. And of course, the management of all chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, requires in a way that people believe a story. Many of these conditions cannot be seen or necessarily felt, say in the case of hypertension or type 2 diabetes. And so they're based entirely upon people hearing, understanding, and believing a story that is told to them, and it just happens to be a story which is based upon our biomedical model. Now, what is our role in all of this? I mean, it's often said that we live in an information age, but really what is never said is that we live in an age of high quality information. It's very common, you know, someone comes to you, they've always, they've Googled it already, you know, doc, I think I've got this, I just want you to give me such and such prescription, right? Right, an easy answer always seems to be within the reach of Dr. Google, and yet we know that Dr. Google does not provide context or understanding. But fundamentally, what patients are doing is they come to you and say, something happened to me, and what they want to know is that someone professional, someone who's knowledgeable, heard their story, used their special knowledge and tools to explain the story, and someone told them what happened next. I think all of us have had the experience of hearing from a patient who says, yeah, yeah, you know, I went to Dr. So-and-so, and yeah, Dr. So-and-so didn't tell me anything. They just gave me this prescription and said, go. And I think all of us have had the experience of knowing that Dr. So-and-so is actually quite a smart and competent doctor. Now, in those situations, it's very hard to know what happened. It's very hard to know, did Dr. So-and-so actually not explain anything? Or did the patient not hear it, not understand it, not internalize it? Both of those things are possible. But whatever it was that fell apart, what we know is the patient's source of dissatisfaction is that they were not told a story which they understood, and which they made their own story. Somewhere along that chain of communication, something was lost. And then you have an unhappy patient who says, yeah, I saw Dr. So-and-so, and they didn't tell me anything, they just, just gave me this prescription, which might be appropriate, but which might not be complied with, because it wasn't explained, or the explanation wasn't heard, or was not understood. Now, it behooves me as a writer to talk a little bit about the role of fiction, or the possible role of fiction in all of this. Because I say this and you might wonder, well, well, how do we get people to tell stories? How do we get people to actually listen to patients? And it's a fair question. And I think that this is not the only answer. I think 
you know, medical training comes with training in listening, comes with training in empathy, and these are all vital components of our professional education. It turns out also that there's actually evidence that literary fiction promotes empathy. And this is a paper which was published in a small little journal that you may have heard of, Science, in 2013. And it's interesting, they actually exposed people to, and I find this fascinating, to literary fiction, um, so difficult, big books that you had to read in school, as well as popular fiction, right? Those are books that you buy in grocery stores. Um, and, you know, that's a broad generalization, of course, uh, and nothing at all, and found specifically that reading literary fiction improves people's performance on these tests called theory of mind. Now, theory of mind is this sort of academic concept which refers to people's ability to understand each other's mental states, uh, thereby enabling complex social relationships within human society. In other words, you know, it's very close to the way that we would think about empathy. So it may, in fact, be that reading tough, difficult, challenging books is good for us as doctors and as healthcare practitioners. Now certainly, I think this is not what patients want. Patients don't want to, uh, to check their symptoms online and uh, then to have someone just come back later for a diagnosis and care plan. That's not what they want at all. Patients want the science which is available to them and to us. And patients also want to know that they have been treated with dignity and with respect and with someone who's living an individual story, which is perhaps why Jerome Gritman tells us that statistics cannot substitute for the human being and statistics always embody averages and not individuals. Now, this is a glass of water. As I said, we live in, a, in an empirical age. If you buy water, it will contain 500 milliliters in a bottle, or a liter, or two liters, depending on what size of bottle you buy. But the real question that you're asking when you buy a bottle of water is, will it satisfy my thirst? We know the distance that it will take us to travel, say from Toronto to London, and London to Toronto. But the real question that we're asking is, am I going to get there well rested, or will I arrive tired and frustrated because of traffic or weather or some other issue? We may ask ourselves, when I get to Toronto, will I like the, when I, will I like the city that I find? Am I going to have a good time? We have an empirical map that will show us our way around, but it may not be what we're actually asking. When we prescribe a statin or a hypertensive medication, yes, there are a number of milligrams on it. There is a published side effect profile. What people really want to know is, what is this going to mean for my risk of dying from a myocardial infarction or from some other preventable cause? Many things are like that. There's an empirical measure, and there's a story which underpins it. When we want to reduce wait times, what we want is that people do not believe that we have forgotten about them in some sort of waiting room or some sort of queue. If we want seamless IT, what we want is for people to feel that their story is linked to our ability to access information and technology. If we want to ensure evidence-based practice, which we should, we want people to know that they are receiving the most up-to-date current information possible, while we also have to recognize its limitations. Because having the best of the available knowledge is part of the desire of a 21st century person. It's part of our current story. We live in a world that's absolutely overflowing with information, and that information is of highly variable quality. And so in this world, the single most important and challenging question, I think, patients ask us as healthcare providers and as doctors is, okay, so this is what's going on. This is what you're prescribing. What will this mean to me? 
And when patients ask that question, what they're really asking is that we engage in their story and tell them what may happen next in their story. I will leave you with this quote from a great Canadian physician. The practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business, a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. Often the best part of your work will have nothing to do with potions and powders. Thank you. <laughs>